This is the Republic XR12 Rainbow. And this is the North American XP70 Valkyrie. These airplanes shared quite a bit in common. And we're going to tell you about that in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. The Rainbow and the Valkyrie had to be two of the most aesthetically beautiful airplanes ever flown. And it's amazing how many uh, things they shared in common. So we're going to talk about the top 10 similarities between the B-70 and the XR-12. But before we talk about the similarities, there's one major difference that we should address, and that is the companies themselves. North American was a titan in the industry. It had major plants in Los Angeles, California, Dallas, Texas, and Columbus, Ohio. And uh, by the time the B-70 was built, they had constructed every possible type of aircraft and missile except for airliners. But they built World War II fighters, bombers, trainers, observation aircraft. In the jet age, uh, they had uh, fighters, uh, aircraft for the Navy, aircraft for the Air Force, even a hypersonic uh, Mach 6 rocket plane. And then there was a Republic that had uh, uh, a plant in Farmingdale, New York, and an annex in uh, Evansville, Indiana during the war, but they built one airplane, the P-47 Thunderbolt during World War II. So the rainbow was quite a stretch. One similarity that two companies did share uh, is that at the end of the war, they produced uh, light aircraft for the intended market that unfortunately never happened. Republic had the CB and North American had the Navion. But let's talk about the top 10 similarities between the XB-70 and the XR-12. Number one, both aircraft were ordered for high performance military missions and both programs were canceled. However, two prototypes were built. And I should mention that the XR-12 was built in competition with the Hughes airplane, uh, both competing for a, uh, a coveted Air Force production contract for the next generation photo recon aircraft. This was the Hughes XF-11, and the original designations were XF-11 and Republic XF-12. F stood for photo uh, during World War II. And after the formation of the Air Force in 1947, that designation was changed to R for reconnaissance. Number two, they were the largest airplanes ever built by their respective manufacturers. The B-70 was a mammoth machine, 185 feet long, 105 foot wingspan, and weighing more than a half a million pounds at takeoff. The Rainbow, seen here with a DC-6, uh, had a 94 foot length with 129 foot wingspan, same as a Lockheed Constellation, I should mention. Max gross takeoff weight, 108,000 pounds. Number three, they were the fastest multi-engine airplanes of their era and remain so to this day. The Rainbow was clocked in flight test at 462 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. Now, I'd like to say this is the fastest multi-engine, but the Rainbow was the fastest four-engine piston-powered aircraft ever flown. The fastest multi-engine airplane was the Jornier DO-335 Arrow, which was clocked at 474 miles per hour at 21,500 feet in World War II. By comparison, the B-70, largest airplane ever flown at Mach 3, uh, achieved 2,000 miles per hour at 70,000 feet, maintained that speed for more than 30 minutes, which was its design goal. Number four, their advanced power plants were flight tested in other contemporary aircraft, sort of. What I mean by that is that the original configuration for the Rainbow was the uh, 3,250 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R4360 piston-powered turbo, uh, I'm sorry, piston-powered uh, power plant uh, with contra-rotating propellers that you see here on this original drawing. And that configuration was fitted to a modified P-47, which was called the XP-72. This airplane was flown. By comparison, the B-70 was powered by six uh, General Electric J-93 turbojets, uh, which produced 29,300 pounds of thrust in afterburner times six. And it was conceived that the J-93 would be test flown uh, in a B-58, which was also uh, powered by General Electric air engines, the J-79s. And the J-93 would be slung in a pod under the uh, uh, bomber's center line. However, once the, uh, the uh, airplane was canceled, uh, this aircraft never flew. Similarity number five. 
Ship one was built for phase one, two, and three flight test, while ship two was a much more advanced airplane used for operational testing. I'd like to show you some comparison photos of the Valkyrie and Rainbow. Here's the Rainbow at Farmingdale under construction. Here's the Valkyrie at Palmdale, California. Here's the Rainbow on rollout, December of 1945. Here's the B-70 at rollout, May of 1964. The flight crew for the Rainbow was uh, Chief Test Pilot Lowry Brabham at left. Center is uh, Oscar Bud Haas, co-pilot, and uh, James Creamer, flight test engineer. Crew for the B-70, project pilot Joe Cotton, and his backup, uh, Fitz Fulton. North American contractor pilots were Al White and Van Shepard. Here's a shot of the Rainbow being prepared for its first flight and the B-70 being prepared for its first flight. First flight of the Rainbow, well, there were actually two. Uh, the unofficial first flight was February uh, 4th of 1946, and that was for company personnel. But the uh, public test flight for the media was February 7th of 1946. First flight of the B-70 at Palmdale uh, was on September 21st, 1964. Same year as the uh, debut of the Ford Mustang. There's some subtle differences between ship one and two of each airplane. We're gonna show those to you. For the B-70, the most obvious difference is the lower radome on ship two. You can see ship one in, uh, in the background by comparison. Ship two also had additional dihedral in the wing and a slight modification to the wing leading edge. For the Rainbow, uh, biggest obvious difference was the addition of a uh, ram's horn VHF antenna above the cockpit, although that was later retrofitted to ship one. But unique to ship two were the gills on the engine cowling that you see here. On the inside, ship two was fully outfitted as a photo recon airplane. It had uh, three different stations for camera operators and different camera configurations. Here looking forward in the cabin of that uh, device that you see on the right side is a dark room, which was fitted to the airplane to allow photos to be developed before the uh, aircraft ever even landed. And here we see the outside, the camera windows, which are electrically heated and covered in flight by rotating uh, doors. Number six, both aircraft had variable geometry nose sections with movable visors that covered heavy fixed inner windshields. What I mean by that is that the windshield was the pressure bulkhead on the rainbow and the area in front of it was just filled with ambient air. In bad weather and at night, the upper uh, plexiglass sections rotated into the lower fuselage, leaving the uh, flat windshield exposed. On the B-70, you see the low speed configuration here where the visor is uh, connected to the forward windshield. And by comparison, this is the uh, high speed in flight where the visor is raised and the pressure bulkhead is inside those three windows that you see at top. Number seven, both second prototypes were lost in accidents involving two fatalities. On November 7th, 1948, uh, XR-12 Ship 2 was being tested at Eglin Air Force Base and uh, on an approach to its final landing of that uh, test series, uh, there were unusual readings in the number two engine and it exploded. The original thought was that it was the engine that uh, exploded, what turned out to be a fuel leak. We'll talk about more of that in a, in a moment. On June 8th, 1966, B-70 number two was completing a scheduled test flight and was in formation with a number of General Electric aircraft for a photo shoot for GE calendar uh, when tragedy struck. And uh, we cover that in an additional episode, which uh, is shown in the link below the title block. Number eight, both these accidents occurred at the end of pilot checkout flights. Lynn Hendricks, seen here on left, later hired as a Republic test pilot, was in the uh, aircraft commander's seat of the Rainbow on that day in November. And uh, he was being checked out in the airplane at the end of a series of uh, photo runs. As I mentioned, it was a fuel leak that was determined to be the uh, source of the problem. And here we see the fuel line to the number two engine and the fuel pump at top. And then the uh, crew rotated that line 180 degrees showing the uh, chafing and eventual rupture of the fuel line, which is what caused the explosion. 
The B-70 was a checkout flight for Major Carl Cross, his first flight in the airplane. He was sitting in the co-pilot seat on that day and was unable to eject out of the airplane and was lost. Again, we cover the details of this accident in a separate episode on escape capsules, but this is a uh, reenactment, a photoshopped uh, image showing the F-104 in the formation in the proximate position uh, that it uh, was in just before the T-tail uh, caught the vortex of the right wingtip and was uh, sucked into the uh, vortices of the airplane. Similarity number nine, both first prototypes continued making test flights for three more years. The Rainbow was testing high-speed uh, aerodynamics and engine uh, operations and flew on as a kind of a squadron hack for an additional uh, three years after the loss of the second airplane. And Ship 1B70 uh, was uh, converted to a NASA research airplane and was testing sonic booms and all sorts of other uh, high-speed large aircraft uh, phenomenon. Both airplanes flew at what became Edwards Air Force Base and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. This is significant. The first rainbow flew at Wright Field, as it was called before in World War II. Ship two flew from Muroc Test Center, California. Here we see ship one at Wright uh, Field on June of 1946, when they began the phase one flight testing. And on September 1st, 1948, Ship 2 took off from Edwards Air Force, what is now Edwards Air Force Base, uh, headed out over the Pacific and turned back uh, and then took the world's first continuous strip photo of the United States, uh, covering uh, from New York to California in a record seven hours. And here we see one of the uh, Fairchild K-17 Trimetragon uh, photos of M Manhattan from 40,000 feet. Pretty dramatic shot. Uh, the aircraft uh, headed out over the Atlantic and descended, circled back, and landed at Mitchell Field on Long Island, not far from Farmingdale, where it was built. And here's the Daily News, uh, Thursday, September 2nd edition, uh, showing the record flight and the airplane at Mitchell. In October 1948, Ship 2 uh, landed for an open house at the newly named Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And this is believed to be one of, if not the final photos, one of the last photos ever taken of ship two before it uh, left for Eglin and was lost in that accident. Both XB-70s by comparison were flown at Edwards Air Force Base initially. In 1969, ship one was flown to the US Air Force Museum at wright Pat Air Force Base, Ohio. Here we see ship two circling over uh, contractor row, that large uh, arch roof hangar at the upper right uh, it was called the Weight and Balance Hangar, and that's where these uh, both these airplanes uh, were housed. And it wouldn't be uh, Edwards without the uh, Piasecki Vertol H-21 rescue helicopter that the flight surgeons uh, were aboard. And these things were always uh, uh, going down the runway at takeoff with the airplane or uh, hovering above uh, during landing to always be there in case anything happened. I should clarify that. It wasn't on the runway. It was above uh, in-flight pickup as the airplane took off. But these airplanes were always, the helicopters were always in the air. On the morning of February 4th, 1969, Ship One had been returned to its original Air Force markings and it departed Edwards for the final flight to Wright Pat and the Air Force Museum where it was displayed outdoors initially. The last flight of the rainbow, unfortunately, was quite different. It was flown to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds and used as a ground target but the B-70 to this day looks just as futuristic as it did in 1964. And there you have it, the story of two very exotic advanced airplanes, the Republic XR-12 Rainbow and the North American XB-70. Thank you for watching Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. I wanna say special thanks to my dear friend, Tony Landis, to Josh Stoff at the Cradle of Aviation Museum and the Wings and Air Power Archive for supporting this program. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.